he had some uh, medical issues he cannot attend. So in order to compensate that, I'll try to use my best English accent to compensate him for that. Uh, I have a t-shirt from him as well, but I look like I'm, a, I'm in, a, in a dress, so I'll keep that in the, in the backpack. Uh, I'm Olympic Pop. I'm working as a, the CTO of, of Mindit.io, a company that is providing product uh, software services. And we are working with companies from uh, um, banking and retail mostly. So if you're flying to a duty-free shop uh, and you, you check something on the, sh on the shelf, it might be a very high probability that it's something that we are working on it as well. We all know what cyber attacks are. Even though it's, it, it came only from, uh, from hacker movies, that was back in the day. But what changed in the meantime, and what I mean meantime might be the last 20 years, is the fact that in 2016, the drug traffic that, you know, it's all the hype in all the movies and everything that we see in the news, it was overtaken by cybersecurity, uh, by cyber attacks. And it's not... It's not uh, just small in comparison. It's half a trillion dollar industry. And what that's, that actually mean is that it's an equivalent of 50 US Nimitz class aircraft carriers, nuclear ones. US has 10 of them. All, the whole world has 10 of them all together, so we can buy 50 if we really want to. But it's 2023. I still know the year that we are in. What happened in the meantime? What do you think happened with the, with the cybercrime? It went up, down, it's remaining constant? It's changed a bit. It's almost $12 trillion. Quite, quite a good scale. Probably it's 30x. We would love to have that in our companies, right? And how does that mean, what does that mean actually in the global scheme? How does it impact in terms of GDPs of other countries that have a better GDP than Romania? First one is US, obviously. China is second. If cybercrime would be a country, it would be on a third place. Overtaking Japan with a 2x factor. And surprising enough, the things are only growing. Uh, people believe that we will see much more supply chain attacks by 2027. Up to 2027, we are expected to see half of the companies of the world being subject of a, cyber, a supply chain attack. And if you look at the last uh, reports, Sonata I released a report uh, last week, it seems that it's tripled in the current year. We have around 250,000 supply chain attacks. So this guy that probably all of us know, uh, Pablo Escobar, stopped trying to move things from one side to another because it's much easier over the internet. He uses a laptop. We all want to use a laptop. But it's more than that. It's even scarier because now we transform laptops, we transform packages, we transform everything that we have into real weapons of mass destruction. And, and there are a couple of, of examples all over the place. We are targeting infrastructure, for instance, the Belarusian cyber, cyber partisans. At points when they are trying to be the nice guys, they, they targeted trains, they targeted critical infrastructure from both Ukraine and, uh, and Belarus. And, of course, that transforms into fake news or other things that might manipulate it. So, at this point of time, geopolitics, geopolitics and um, the real world are coming together. But let's, let me bring it closer to here. We are in Romania, so we are all around us. We are having Ukraine as our neighbor. And these are some facts that happened. Unfortunately, uh, they are still going. They are still outdated. It, this is one year of war. Uh, I didn't find any other statistics. But what it actually means, 9 million people are dislocated from Ukraine. Millions are already died on both sides, and I leave you look at it, and you already know it. But what does it have to do with uh, cybercrime? These are the statistics of cybercrime and attacks targeted to to Ukraine. 
in the last couple of months before the war. In the first part, you can see that it's just minor attacks. These are uh, coming from the Gamma Radian uh, domains. These are uh, companies. These are companies affiliated with the Kremlin. And here are the moments, the spikes. You can see these are the moments before the war. In December, overflowing in, in January, and then in the peak uh, peak of it being 24th of January when the war started. Everything happened. Everything was just crazy. Attacks over attacks. They are just targeting everything from uh, satellite dishes to um, governmental organizations, whatever they managed to do in order to, to unplug the system in Ukraine. And the funny thing is that as the internet is so interconnected, it's not only affected them. They affected Germany, they affected wind turbines in Germany and all over the place. And what they use they are basic things, things that you might use, just destroying. They are using wipers that might take your, your laptop and transform it into a brick. They are using um, so-called uh, fake denial of service attacks to just unplug you from, uh, from the network and everything else that might make you easy. And the funny thing is that now those things are have appear on the, on the open market so everybody can use it because now not only companies are targeted, everybody's targeted. Because they just realized that with the amount of people that are connected to the internet, it means that we can take drops from everybody rather than just trying to attack a fortress. And that, uh, that's also things that we can see in also in financial crime. But last year, in 2022, not only the Ukraine war started, something good happened as well. We all got access to, to AI. We are not alone anymore. We, are, we have ChatGPT to discuss whenever we want. But actually, there are other guys that are using it as well. Uh, the attack surface that we currently have, it's much broader. Now, if we look at it, when you're discussing and you want, and you want to build a personal assistant, all the information about you, about your banking statement, about everything that you have, it's there. So now, it's just about convincing this um, fragile link, this uh, virtual assistant that we have in our pockets to just allow you to provide more information about yourself and everything else. Or, on the other end, they are using uh, anybody that is ill-willed has more information to do it. And in the last period, other, other options appeared, uh, versions of ChatGPT for the dark web. And some of you might know the, the cyber kiddies that everybody used, and it was triggered multiple waves of attacks. Now we have the prompt kiddies, and it's easy, because if you're persuasive enough, you can just convince through a prompt the, the, the virtual assistant to do anything. So probably my, my son, that is quite persuasive, at four years old, might convince ChatGPT to show him nuclear power plants. plants. But coming back at uh, our, our basic libraries and what we usually use, what happened back in the day was hackers were looking for vulnerabilities. They are just uh, surfing the CVEs, databases. They are trying to find the hole in the system to, to see exactly what they can use against you. Currently, uh, probably 60% of the attacks that are happening, 60% of the exploits, that are put together are not using zero-day vulnerabilities. They are using already known vulnerabilities. For instance, lock for shell is their preferred one because it has multiple facets. And now they do something else. It's open source. Everybody can put uh, something on the web. They, do, they make their own. For instance, how many of you look into, into your repositories? And not, even, not only Java, but... Uh, Node.js, anything else, and you have upgrade to latest. So then what they are doing is that they use dependency confusion, they use table squatting. They are just changing a, a, a letter. It's just a fat finger, you just press it, and it's all over the place. Or you have build tool attacks, where you just have something thrown anywhere, and they are just confusing it. For instance, Maven is quite sensible into the order of the lines into dependency management. So now they just drop the bomb there for somebody to trip into it. It's just like a minefield. 
unfortunately, the winter is coming and we need to close the window. But they are, they are closing the window as well. The zero day window is closing. In, if in the 2006, 2007, you had up to 40, 50 days uh, of time where you can be sure that you can fix the vulnerability, now it's not the case anymore. It's already there, day one, it's already exploited. And because of that, we really need to see also the other, the other side of the coin. Nation states are using that. China is using that. Uh, North Korea is, is using that. And they are paying a huge amount of money. On average, zero-day vulnerabilities in iOS, for instance, are sold in the amount, with amounts like tens of thousands and even hundreds of thousands of euros, even millions, in, uh, into multiple aspects. And the more severe the vulnerability is, obviously, it's, it's much more expensive. Now we can see also challenges. People that are fighting to find vulnerabilities and why not build them? It's, it's as uh, easy as that. And the only purpose is exploit. We want to be there, we want to do that. And if you think it's surprising, it would not affect me. It would not affect my company, we are just doing accounting software. Uh, back, uh, I think 10 or 15 years ago, NotPetya was one of the hardest vulnerabilities that ever hit a company. And they started from an accounting company in Ukraine. They, they thought when the, when the military police came and they were raided the, their servers, they said, we never thought anybody would be interested about our accounting software. And just to name some figures, Maersk, Maersk, the um, freight company that is moving containers all over the world, they said they lost around 100 to 200 million dollars. This is the official amount that they put. Probably is much better than, uh, much bigger than that. So, modern cyber attacks are all about supply chain. It's a, a big pipe that is coming in our software systems, and most often than not, we don't know exactly what's coming because. Um, if you look at it, a basic app, Java application or any other ones have at least 10 to 50 direct dependencies. Behind that, if you multiply that, you have a couple of thousands of dependencies that you don't even know where they are because you just see at the, at the height of the iceberg. And uh, to look at it deeper, 90% of the applications that are currently built, they are built from open source. We are just putting a small layer on top of everything that already exists, and we call it our own software. And together with that, we take vulnerabilities, we take code that we don't know, and also licenses that we don't fully understand. So what can we do to secure it? And we all know how much we like reading licenses. Uh, I, I bet that each of us is reading every evening at least a license like uh, Windows or Linux. I prefer Linux, my, my kids love it. If you, every evening I, I read them to them, so uh, today probably is in CentOS. But there are other guys that are trying to make us do it. It's you know like parents trying to convince kids to, to eat their veggies. So that happens currently as well. US, EU, UK, Australia, Japan, you name it. Well, China doesn't want to do that because they, they need the vulnerabilities in other places. And also open source organizations. Together with, uh, together with governmental organizations, they are trying to put together. You definitely heard about OWASP. Well, they have some uh, family issues these days because they have a lot of fights uh, inside their organization, but they still want to do other things. We all want to deploy on Kubernetes. We all want to do cloud. Yes, but cloud-native computing is also an attack surface that is quite high. And last but not least, the OpenSSF coming as an organization of the Linux Foundation, they are trying to help us make the things better. Why? Because we should stop looking at the cake in our plate and try to understand what are the ingredients behind it. Well, I'll do it at home as well. We cannot use a microscope when we have everything because we should know exactly What's on the label of it? Yes, after naming conventions and naming properly our classes and files, 
we love having more chores. Well, surprise, we'll have much more chores. And one of them will be to just have an SBOM, meaning put a label on the software that we provide. Read the label that uh, we get when we introduce uh, software in our systems. We need to make sure that what we deliver is actually what we say we deliver. It has the same amount of sugar and salt that we promote, want to, to do. We audit our security recurrently, and that we have a disclosure vulnerability program. Uh, not long ago, I was discussing with a couple of companies, and I was asking them, uh, what happens if I have a problem? Well, don't worry, we'll call you. Yeah, well, that's, that's what I'm afraid that you would, will not. And in order to put the things together, the, there are a couple of organizations. There are three of them, three standards that are approved by the government of the United States. I'm mentioning the US a lot because they are the ones that are the most advanced into what they are doing and they are pushing the things forward in comparison with Europe that is um, kind of sabotaging itself, trying to put uh, open source in the corner for what they are doing, even though Europe is built on open source. And the three formats that we discuss are Cyclone DX, that is uh, in put together by OWASP Foundation, and we are also SPD SPDX, that it's put together by the ISO organizations. So, what is actually an SBOM? A software bill of material is what it actually says. It's a label of what we have on the software. You just flip uh, our system and you check exactly what's there, the version that we use, the vulnerability that it comes from, and of course, on top of that, you can see what are the scores and the probability of having your system attacked. But that's all, all in vain if we don't have the proper tools to look at it and flag us, pull our uh, hand and tell us, guys, you have a problem. It's a problem that you need to fix, and then it's up to you what you do. What actually a good tool looks like, it's a tool that looks into archives. It's a tool that looks into second, third, re recursive dependencies that are not exactly only in one place, looking at only at the surface, but going all over the place and making sure that you have everything together. That checks ISO files, that checks um, file systems, everything that you would not think about it to make sure that all, everything is put together. Jar files, ar RPM archives, you name it. And how would this look in a very complicated scheme? Uh, you, you, take your, you take your files from different sources. If you're using Java, you're probably using uh, Maven Central that is put together by Sonotype. If you're using JavaScript, you're taking them from uh, NPM or PyPy if you're using Python and other ones as well. So after that, imagine that you have the, the files. You cannot read all of them, as we discussed. For one project, you have hundreds if not thousands of files that you need to, to process. So at that point are the places that you have to check. And you have to check them against vulnerability databases. Pretty much most of the organizations are keeping together. Uh, there is an open source index that keeps them organized. Oracle has one of them. Um, Debian has it. Pretty much all the organizations have it. So tools, scanning tools, open source or paid ones, will just look at them and just start labeling them. Hey, dude, you have a vulnerability that is 9.5. That means it's highly critical. You should do something about it. And after that, there are tools like Guac, for instance, the tool from, um, from Google that was just takes all this information and creates a graph with all the information that you have. Other tools exist as well, but I'll just keep it to, to these ones. And afterwards, you need to have internal policies. OK, we have vulnerabilities. Will them affect us? Are they exposed to the, to the open internet? What can we do about it? And at that point, we need to patch them or replace them with already organized versions. And just to name a couple of tools, uh, Sift and Gripe are two open source tools that are, can be used in, uh, together that are providing all the information. If Sift provides information about what's happening and creates an S-bomb based on the information that you provide, so just think about it. You just take it. You, you point it to a folder, and after that, it will just 
scan everything and provide all the information in comp uh, after checking databases of vulnerabilities to just make sure that you have all the proper information. And most of the organizations are providing that. Kubernetes has uh, uh, bombs. Those are called uh, I-bombs, or Microsoft started creating a tool. And the, this is a good option. Sonatype had uh, put it on, uh, on their site some time ago. It's still open. Probably it will be integrated uh, soon enough in other organizations that looks at all the whole ecosystem that you have. It looks at, at, the, your, at your dependency tree and creates a score based on the output that you have. Uh, the, the highest it is, closest to the, the highest rank, it can be 500. And if you reach that one, you're safe, or hopefully safe. And otherwise, it will just provide uh, other options and points. What are the vulnerabilities that are actually on your, on your system? But more than that, there are other pillars as well. So we had SBOM to be transparent and understand what we have. After that, do we actually have what we think we have? And that's the part with reproducible builds, meaning that what we currently have on the system, it's something that we can check. We can take the source code, and after we go to the build process, we'll have a binary that it's exactly the same bit with, after bit with the ones that we had. Up to this point, there are not pure builds. I can tell you that Debian is working hard on obtaining that because Debian is taking everything that they put together and they are recompiling it. And they, they can provide the, the certainty that everything is as clean as possible. And the first ecosystem, the first programming language that put together something about it that makes a difference, actually, it's Go. Go released in August. Uh, their first um, version that contains a fully reproducible ecosystem, the ho their whole tool chain, compiler, uh, assembler, everything, puts together and can provide the certainty of, uh, of similarity. Then the, we cannot do that. Imagine yourself creating, you, it doesn't happen to you, but I'm sure that for me it would be hard to have a proper pipeline to do everything as according and, and as fast as possible to, to have a proper and continuous integration pipeline. But uh, if you don't want to do that, there are the work is being done in the signature part, meaning that you know exactly who did it. There is a signature that comes and says, certifies, okay, this is properly and uh, it's labeled accordingly. And now I can just check against the database and see whether those that put it there, just imagine it's like a certificate authority. If you click on the HTTPS, you'll just make sure that who signed the, the, the given file is the one that actually did it also. So these are the other efforts that are happening together with the SBOM that will try to provide more, more certainty about the things that we consume. So looking back, we need to make sure that our software supply chain is secure, and we can do that by looking at what we have coming towards us, uh, make sure that what we have is actually what it is, and we can do that in, uh, in multiple ways. But hey, winter is coming. I bet you don't know exactly what, what you did two years ago in December. I know. I woke up around 3, 3 a.m. in the morning, and I just said, okay, I have three, four hours until my kids wake up where I can just enjoy the silence and work on something. I did a stupid mistake, I know all of us do. I tapped on the email that came. And the guy from, uh, from UK was saying, hey guys, there is a, some kind of vulnerability that is affecting most of us. You know, log4j, it might have an impact. Come on, it's log4j. What can it do? But actually, that led to Log4Shell. And the snowball effect that it has on everything that is happening started from this one. Because it seems that Log4J is pretty much everywhere. And at that point, I was working for a JavaScript company. They, OK, we are not affected. We don't use Java. Java is stupid. Great. But we use cloud. And cloud uses Java. And at that point, we had to work through it to make sure that we, we fix our versions. And it happened at least five times in, in a week. 
So it doesn't apply to us, right? I have a bet that it actually does. Based on the downloads statistics that happened uh, in December 2021, a third of the downloads from Maven Central were of versions that were vulnerable. Let's take a guess. How much did that change in the last two years? Now it's 25%. Two years in the vulnerability, it's 25%. We are downloading over and over again the same versions that are vulnerable. And one of the top 20 vulnerabilities used today is log for shell Again, this is why. And this is also in numbers. So it's a couple of millions of downloads that are happening to be vulnerable. I bet you heard this at least twice uh, after I, I hear it a couple of times per day. It's my role, it's my responsibility. I should put my hands on it and run with it. And looking at facts, 96% of the downloads from Maven Central are using vulnerable versions that actually have a fix. Only 4% of the downloads don't have a proper fix. And here is also a balance where we can take something else. So what happens? Why don't you know what we're taking? Why do we take the spoiled fruits from the, from the shelf when we are doing the shopping? And because one of the questions that you usually have, how do I convince my manager that something is good for them? Use numbers. These are statistics that are done from the, from the supply chain report done by Sonatype and others as well that are saying the following, that every time we, we upgrade, we use at least two weeks of our team's time. Using the average size of the team in the US, we get to a quarter of a million dollars. I bet that this is something that will convince most of the, of the managers, because managers are loving statistics and they love Excel. And, okay, we don't want to use tools. We don't want to use command line tools. But we can look it, uh, into Maven Central. They started putting information like direct links to the dependency tree. They started providing information about the OSS index, where you can just see all the vulnerabilities that are happening. And this is happening for all the ecosystem. It's also available for Python. It's also available for Go. JavaScript, because JavaScript is also quite rapidly growing. And also, you can just click the proper version. It's just about wanting it. So, how should we look at open source? We usually look at popularity. If the guy from across the street uses it, it's definitely the proper one. But no, more than that, we need to make sure that it's maintained. Uh, what's the risk that is put together with it? Do they have an S-bomb that provides us the whole ecosystem, all the picture that there, there are, uh, all the picture together with everything that is put, to, uh, put there? What's their security posture? What's their ability to provide updates? How often do they do updates? Because if it's um, twice per quarter, uh, twice per quarter of a century, it doesn't really matter. So what do we need to check? What's the cadence of the releases? Do they do it properly? What's the patterns that they see? How many maintainers do they have? Do they have a static analysis tool that is checking for the security? How often do they do breaking changes? How often do they put together, they put bugs that shouldn't be there? But it's more, more than that. Look at the license, uh, license as well. How how honest they are with what they need to do together. Do they have a vulnerability reporting process? And all the things that we know that should, we know that what are the best practices, but do we ask them if they do code review? How does the, their build process look like? How they, do they check all the things that are happening during that, that particular point of time? Because it's one thing of knowing what we need, and it's the other thing that we do it. 
Because how often do we use a new library? It happens once every couple of months, let's say, most often. And after that, it's harder to change it. It's harder to just make sure that we need to rip it out. So let's be careful about it. Open Security Foundation has, a, has scorecards that are put together with, uh, with this kind of information. And together with that, they just look at connections between software practices, best practices, and the possibility of having vulnerabilities in your system. Code review is one of the, of the subjects that are ensuring that the software is more secure, so let's use it. And after that, it's about having secure branches. Those branches are there. We need to harden them to, to make sure that everything is, is properly. And as we mentioned earlier, typo squatting and other things, if we have the dependencies fixed of mergers that we pick, it's not something that is coming randomly, then we are much uh, sure, certain about what's, uh, what's happening in our ecosystem. But, of course, it's too much happening. And that's why tools are there to help us. And more than that, if you need to convince other people as well, you can convince also the people from HR, oh, sorry, people from people and culture, uh, as they call themselves these days, that if we have an appropriate ecosystem, we have an informed team, we'll have a happy team. Because in the end, that's what we want. All of us want to be happier and uh, live a longer life. And that's one of the reasons that developer productivity uh, will be pushed forward. So, just to look at what's, uh, what are the three things that we can do today to make our lives easier when we move forward are looking at the supply chain, understanding exactly what's, what's there, ensuring that this one is secure, and make sure that you do all the things proper, uh, proper for your ecosystem to stay away from, from that. If there are any questions, please shoot. Okay, then I have a question for you. Um, December is coming. Uh, this is the project that I, I worked on in the last 11 years. Java Advent Calendar is coming, so that means that each day of, uh, of the month of December will have an article coming out. The, the QR code is for the RFP, so if you want to cont contribute with an article, just make sure you submit it. It's just a plain Google form. If not, I'm pretty sure that we'll have excellent content. We had excellent content in the last 11 years, so be sure that uh, you drop by and see what's, what we have. Thank you. Stay safe.